This is Stephen Sargent, the new host of the Around the Coin podcast. In this inaugural episode, I was able to talk to the creator and host of the Around the Coin podcast as he passes the torch on to me to kind of lead us through the next few years. Mike Townsend, he's building Grupo. He's also the, was the founder of Higher Honor, just an entrepreneur by spirit and by heart. We go into a lot about entrepreneurship. We talk about what it takes to build a successful podcast and where we would like to go with this podcast in the future. This is a great episode where Mike gets to flip the camera around. And finally, he's the one answering the questions after spending almost a decade asking the most influential people in payment, tech and crypto the questions. This is Mike Townsend and Stephen Sargent as we continue on with the Around the Coin podcast. Enjoy the episode. All right. Well, I'm especially excited today to have Steven on the podcast because we're going to flip the script. I'm going to be the guest. Steven is going to be the host as well as taking over to do new hosts in the future, uh, to be a host going forward in the future. So today's conversation will be unusually focused on me. Steven will lead the conversation and let's dive in. Steve, I'm super excited to be chatting with you live. Yeah, it's fun. I think it was such a like a random thing. I saw one of your guests on the podcast, that's also on a podcast that I helped produce. And I was like, oh, like, you know, I haven't listened to Around the Coin in a few months, but I've listened for almost six years. And you're actually the podcast that got me into the industry of in cryptocurrency. So just give a little bit of background, I'll be really short. I was a paralegal, maybe three and a half, you know, about four years into my career. And I realized I didn't want to be a paralegal anymore. I wanted to get into crypto. I was listening to your podcast and I reached out to Fives all the time. And he's like, hey, Here's five ways that you can leave, use your paralegal, your, your research and writing skills to get into compliance. And I actually took exactly what he did. I still have this email to this day that I post on LinkedIn sometimes. And I actually got into crypto via compliance angle. I worked at HSBC as an anti-money laundering officer and in compliance. And I was actually the first AML officer and compliance person at Bitfinex, which is a large cryptocurrency exchange, which has been mentioned a few times on the podcast, usually for one reason or another. So this is kind of a full, full circle moment for me. And that gives you a little bit of a background on how I got here. But Mike, I've been listening to you for years. Tell us, take us back to like, you know, when you're sitting down, probably either out of coffee or you're online messing around and you're like, you know what? Cryptocurrency, Bitcoin's at like $400. Why don't we start talking about payments, tech? Take me back to those early conversations with maybe the couple first hosts uh, of Around the Coin. Yeah, it was started by a Quora conversation. So I was writing pretty actively on Quora, really with the strict focus of trying to get customers for a startup that I had, which was called Zing Checkout. And Zing Checkout was a mobile point of sale system. So you could think of it like Square before Square was around. We started in 2012 and 2013 is when we were running it. And I would write on Quora to try to get new customers, right? What is the best point of sale systems used for my clothing store? that would be an answer that I would answer. And I would talk about all the features and the different companies out there. And so I would focus pretty intently on payments and point of sale systems. And I became one of the top writers for point of sale and payments, along with Brian Romley and Faisal Khan. And there was some other people there, but these two stood out as just being so incredibly active on Quora. Faisal and Brian both were top writers like seven years in a row. And I would see so much and learn so much from their writings that eventually I would respond to them in comments and we'd go back and forth on comments, start to build some sort of reputation and relationship. I sent them a message one day saying, if I organize it and I do all the work, would you run a podcast with me? And at the time I'd been interested in podcasting. I had listened to a bunch and I'd always be listening to audiobooks and podcasts in the car. And they both said yes. And it was this like excited yes, like, yes, let's do it this week. And so we hopped on <laughs> Skype. And for the first five years, we ran it on Skype. And it was just us. And we would run it on Sunday mornings. And for two to three hours, maybe an hour of pre-show conversation and two hours of recorded, we would just talk about whatever is topical in the world. And Brian and Faisal would have different perspectives on things. And I would kind of mediate their perspectives and maybe give my perspective as an entrepreneur. And that would be what we did for the first release 
six years. And the first guest didn't start till 2019. So now the podcast is 10 years old and we, you know, have you on board and, and I'm really excited about the future. I have so many questions. So first of all, Cora, I didn't know about Cora until I started listening to your podcast. I remember Faisal was, it's a great place to like provide your expertise and become a thought leader. Is Cora still a thing? Like, I know it's still out there. Are people actively using it? You almost kind of hacked the system and use it as like an area where you can provide thought leadership, almost like the early days of LinkedIn. When everyone's looking for jobs, you're using it as maybe like a test, a test pool, uh, some research and development, which is not the way people normally use these or early adopters use it. Tell me a little bit about Quora. Yeah, I think of Quora as the, it's like if Reddit and Wikipedia had a baby, that's Quora. And it's easy to contribute answers. It's very social, which is unlike Wikipedia. But then it's also this, it, this giant encyclopedia of information, which is not as cleanly packaged as like Wikipedia would be, but it's more, more cleanly packaged than like what Reddit would be. And <laughs> it, it does facilitate a lot of social dynamics that you just don't get on Wikipedia. And even on Reddit, it's not, it's not about the person as much and the profile. It's more about just what they're saying. So I like it personally. I don't know how they're doing as a company. I haven't heard from them in a while. They raised a ton of money a few years ago, and I'm sure they'll be fine for years to come. Business model wise, you know, they launched some paid products. I, I don't know. I, I hope they win, I, but I don't know. A tough one. Now I'm all hmm. about like shooting your shot. That's what I did with you, right? I kind of reached out to your producer and said, Hey, if, if you need any support, I'm here. Uh, I would love to like produce or be a part of this project. And he's like, oh, let me get Mike on. <laughs> we need to have a talk because, you know, Mike's looking to transition this into a different, uh, a different area or a different avenue. But one thing you mentioned is that you said, hey, guys, I'll do all the work when you reach out to Brian and Faisal. Did that come from a place of you felt like they had more leverage than you? Did it come from a place like, I really want this to happen. And I know if I want this to happen, I have to do it myself and kind of drive the train. Where did that position of you saying that you do all the work? Because I think that's an interesting thing when people reach out to others is that kind of leverage dynamic or if trying to find a win-win situation for everyone. Yeah, I remember a quote by Mark Cuban, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks and a bunch of other things. And he said, the people who win don't necessarily have the best products, but they make it the easiest to buy. And the easiest to buy is also the easiest to say yes. And so whether it's a partnership, a customer, a girlfriend, whatever, if you can make it easy to say yes and in this case, it was just show up, click the link. I'll do all the recording. I'll do all the back end. I'll set up all the accounts. I'll do, do all that. You have the knowledge. And so recognizing I'm in this position of like, I'm like the point guard, right? I'm not going to slam dunk the ball, but like I'll, I'll dish it out to these guys who know a lot more than I do. So I, I, I recognize my position as someone who is going to facilitate, moderate the conversation, but I'm not going to fill it with two hours of conversation. If I were to guess, I would, I bet I was like, 10% of the airtime on, on that podcast for the first five years. But I was happy to I do think that. you did a great job navigating it. If I remember correctly, you did such a great job of, you know, you have two heavyweights in the ring. You can't just let them slug it out for two hours. They both get exhausted. You did a great job of tying in, you know, relevant subject matter, adding in insightful quotes or thoughts from other people outside of the call. And I remember those pre-call conversations i remember one time you started posting them on the podcast and letting people hear them and i remember how crazy that was because you used to talk about them so much and as a listener you're like oh man what i would give to kind of be sitting there while they're talking about payments and crypto and compliance and regulations and tech which is very very interesting i feel like time crunch could you do you think you could do the same thing today that you did back then from like a two hour three hour point do you think it would have been feasible to do that now with all the distractions and what's going on and all the opportunities people have. Do you think you started and launched at the right time when maybe there was a less noise in the industry? I think you, I still think podcasting is underutilized. I think there's so many smart people who don't speak publicly. And there's a lot of people who speak publicly focused on growing a audience that don't have much to say. And I think you have to combine it in different ways. And we've talked about this a little bit, but one of the things I'm excited about experimenting with on this podcast is doing an around the table, like around the coin con conceptually is <laughs> I have a couple people here and they disagree on things and they agree on some other things. 
things, but they all are knowledgeable about a topic. And then we pull out the truth from each of their perspectives. I think that's one thing you see in podcasting today, which is there's so much, initially it was short form. You know, this is a quick, you know, rec reporters started this, but give it up for mainstream media. You know, they were the ones who started the pattern of interviewing people. And it would typically be like, okay, we got this person in talking head. Tell me your take on Tesla stock, right? And it's a short thing. But then the long form podcasting started to emerge. When that happened, it, it kind of took off from like 2016 to 20, even today, right? 2023. But I, th I still think there's a gap in what is possible with combining people in unique ways and unique people on, on podcasts. So that's how I, I mean, that's how we're, we are doing it, but that's how I think the exciting opportunity is. I think it's interesting. It's funny. If you go on places like Instagram and TikTok, people are in podcast settings and they don't actually have a podcast, right? They have the podcast mics. They might have a name of a podcast, but they're just looking to get these quick 15 second, 20 second controversial hits that will go viral. But if you ever want to like download the full episode, there is no such thing as a full episode. So it's funny that actually people are pretending to be on podcasts. I don't think as a podcaster, it's like being an entrepreneur, right? Nobody ever thought being an entrepreneur would be cool. And then it goes mainstream and like people are pretending to be me. Do they know how hard creating a podcast is? But mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of zone in on the entrepreneur. That's how you mentioned and that's how you refer to yourself. You always had that entrepreneurial spirit. That's one thing I remember with speaking with you and Brian and Faisal is that you always talked a little bit more about entrepreneurship. You always had all these businesses going on. Tell us a little bit about what your focus will be from that entrepreneurial lens today. I guess what to say about that, probably just that that's where I'm gravitated to because of my personality and disposition and experience. Like I view what makes a good entrepreneur is that they're good enough to contribute to all levels of the stack and the stack, meaning everything that the business does, like the marketing, the branding, the logo design, the front end, all the way down to the back end software programming and choosing APIs or settlement layers, whatever you're building. The, the entrepreneur doesn't have to be the best at each of those but they have to be able to just float in to meetings and at least add some value or at least understand what's going on. You sometimes see some people who just won't, they won't jump in the finance meeting. They're like, oh, I don't want, I don't want accounting and finance. That really hurts you. And if you don't contribute to product or you don't understand marketing, you don't understand your customer and psychology. So for whatever reason, I just am very curious person, you know, hence the podcasting and, and just have learned enough about each of these things to have a competency to get ideas off the ground. Most people just struggle to go zero to one and I, and I go zero to one quite easily. And so the, the restraint on my side is like sticking with something, you know, you started something, okay, stick with it for two, three, four or five plus years. That's the challenge for <laughs> someone like myself. Can you talk about like financials? Like you don't have to tell me how much money you make or from these businesses, but I think that's always the toughest part that keeps people from entrepreneurship is how do I kind of backfill my nine to five pay? And then you're constantly finding clients or customers or users. Talk to us about maybe some of your journeys. You started up a lot of different businesses. Was there ones that were like, oh, this is much easier than I thought it would be. And are there others like, yo, this should be going a lot better, but things aren't clicking. The product market fit isn't what we thought it would be. Take us through that kind of that entrepreneur journey. And like, how did you manage financially to stay afloat or what kind of investments did you make in yourself? or some of the businesses that you're working on? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I kind of view this question as like surfing. Like when you surf, you you catch a wave and you ride it. And then, you know, in surfing, you don't really ride two ways, but when you're, imagine transitioning one wave to the next, it's all about like energy transition. So if you're wanting to start a company and you're working at another company, then there has to be a transition. And many people either don't don't engage in starting a company because they look at it as like dropping off a cliff. Like, oh God, I have to quit my business and then I quit my, my job, zero salary, and then go and do this daunting thing. And I view it more like maybe, a, maybe like a plane taking off where you just put fuel in the engine, you do all the checks, you drive to the runway, you start driving down the runway, and then you go faster and faster and faster. And that might be like, adding a website, building a social media account, starting to post on social media, starting to build some software, starting to contact some partners. These are like the planes going faster and you're doing this nights and weekends. And eventually you get to a point where you're like, I can see it. Like I can see how this can take off. 
And then depending on the job, you like pull back from that part time or leave entirely. And so it's always been that sort of relationship with like, this is a business that I'm running. The first one at Zing, we raised some money. We moved to Austin. We ended up selling it to Big Commerce, which is a large payment company. And then, you know, raise, we raised 23 million in venture capital for my next business at Home Hero. We, we scaled that. We hit some regulatory challenges, but we ended up selling the company. And then it just like, you flow into the next thing. The thing I'd probably say is to more deeply reflect on the founder market fit you know, why are you a good fit for this idea? Because there are a lot of ideas. There's so many ideas, so many products that can be built. But the question is, why are you a good fit for this specific idea? Is it just because you had this idea or is this like part of your life in some meaningful way, either from some pain you experience as a child or adolescent or in your younger years or, or something you love? Like I love, you know, building roller coasters. So I'm going to start an amusement park or I love... <laughs> I'm a doctor. I love working on people. So I started health tech companies. You see, I think it has to be channeled from either one of those two directions. Now, there's a lot of founders as guests on this uh, podcast, as well as our listeners to this podcast. And they hear exciting news, like you sold a business or you sold multiple companies and you're talking, you know, tens of millions of dollars. Was there any kind of life-changing money to you from selling one of these businesses? Or did money not matter after that point? Once you you know, grinded for years and years and devote so much of your time and intention, the money was just kind of like a byproduct or was it like, hey, we got to the financial goals that we wanted to, let's do this all over again, faster, you know, bigger, harder. What are your thoughts around that? We, d we didn't have the exit that we wanted at Home Hero. We raised a $1 million series seed, 3 million or uh, four, four plus million series A or, you know, whatever you want to call it. Labels are for jars. I, I don't really believe in the, the labeling of different rounds. And then we raised 18, call it Series B. But we raised too much money. And we raised too much money. And the implication of that was we ended up having too high of a post-money valuation to live up to, given the run rate or the revenue that we had at the time. And there's a tremendous market. You know, there's this big market of like home care givers that we were going after. So you could tell a story. And we had an awesome team. And we had a nice looking brand. And in the market was hot. So all the pieces together led us to raise a lot. But the price for raising too much money is that you don't meet the expectations of the investors and you can't get to the next checkpoint. You can't get to like Series C revenue. And so that means you end up raising a down round or you raise less money than you raise at a lower valuation than you did last round. Right. Meaning the people who put money in, in the, in the Series A, their return on investment, at least on paper, is lower than it was when they invested. So that creates this, this dynamic where the, on the cap table, as a founder, you're owning less of a company over time and while the company right. is not increasing in value. And so while we raised a lot and we had this exciting business, we raised too much money. We ended up giving money back. We gave back, I think, about $8 million or so, renegotiated the cap table, and then had a smaller, more efficient company. We sold that for a couple million. Pull, so pulled off. Uh, we had some some egg, small exit, you know, under a, a million each for the founders. But it was enough to like buy a condo for five hundred k in L.A. Right. You know, pay rent for the <laughs> next couple of years. So it wasn't like life changing where I'm gonna, you know, do whatever I want. But it was a, and McLaren's. <laughs> yeah, but it was like, dude, I was broke before that. So, you know, like <laughs> it was enough. It was just different, different checkpoints you hit, I guess, or how you think about money. One is like, okay, I got to pay rent next month. The other is I have enough money to survive for a couple of years. But, you know, the other, the next would be like, we sell it for 50 million. And then you're like, people, the other thing about money I'll say is that people find a way to worry about money if they want to worry about it, regardless of how right. much they have. There's some millionaires who feel point. more poor than people going month to month. So I, I view abundance as really a mentality. And then the money takes care of itself if you work on things that are valuable. And, you know, I know we're going to kind of like narrow down to your personal experience. I think you don't really get a chance to talk about your experience on the podcast, which is why I want to really get into some of these things. What was it like when you're raising a lot of money? I'm sure you're the bell of the ball. You feel good. The company feels good. The investors feels good. How, did, how does that, does your dynamics change? 
Do you start being a little less frugal than you were when you're, you know, or when you're bootstrapping it? How does the money change the dynamics of the business from that perspective? From the perspective of the business. Like, now you raised a lot of money. As you said, there's a lot of expectations. You know, when you're first starting out, I'm sure you're not hiring a ton of people. You're trying to be as lean as possible. Now you have the money to kind of, you know, see the vision through. Do you start, start spending maybe more than you should have? How does it work like from your perspective? And then now, obviously, a lot more companies, partnerships, opportunities are probably coming in. People see that you've raised money and all of a sudden now they're looking for ways to probably either capture that money or work together so that they can also raise funds as well. Yeah, I think the dynamic that happens and certainly happened for us was you have the money, so you have the potential, and then you have people who promise growth, and then you have investors who gave you the money who want the growth. And so you end up saying, well, let's just launch all these different initiatives and let's see what works. And you kind of go into this mode of like thinking there, there's not an incentive to not spend it very often. At least in the, if you think about it from like an R&D standpoint, you say, well, right. we're going to put a few hundred K, three or 400 K into this. Uh, maybe we did local advertising. So we put buses mm -hmm. and billboards and benches and we just tried that, which went nowhere, <laughs> <laughs> learned a lot from it. But I, I think the right, the right way to think about spending money, this is the most generic, broad advice. So obviously it varies for everyone, but is to be very disciplined in the areas of spend, which will remain consistent over time. So like, what's our cost per acquisition? How much is it, are we spending on engineering for the product? That's going to be the same category of spend, whether you're a $5 million or $500 million company right. and getting discipline in that is important. Then you have like R and D on growth and, and growth spend typically varies by the liquidity in the venture capital market. If there's a lot of money to be spent from VCs, <laughs> then people spend it on growth and they, and they prioritize marginal profit less in times of high liquidity. This would be like Right. 2021, there's zero rate interest <laughs> rates. There's a lot of money yeah, a lot that of money people in the have, system. right? And that money yeah. generally gets distributed down to big tech. You know, mm. startups raise money from venture capital. Venture capital gets their money from LPs. LPs would be like large funds. And so that all that money from LPs goes to VCs, goes to startups, goes to big tech in the form of advertising. We spend our money on Facebook ads, Instagram ads, Google ads, all for the goal of acquiring customers. And so when that dries up, it's like the whole thing kind of dries up. Interesting. Well, lastly, on business, was you, you talked about all the opportunities, all these different businesses and finding what was your kind of founder led mission. What were some of the businesses that you were looking, that you would love to kind of pursue that you, that worked out or may not have worked out that caught your eye at that time yeah. that you may have passed up on because you were busy working on some of the businesses that you were raising for and working with? Yeah, it's a good question. Certainly a few come to mind. One is I think in-house on-demand dental cleaning. I don't think that exists. I think it should exist. We, we, I kind of iterated with an idea called Pearly where we're like, oh, okay, maybe we do this. I think that should still exist. Two, I think the way that we in the United States at least structure our food production is, has a broken incentives. We have large monocrop farming. And so the way that we produce food is like large monocrop farms. Well, the only way to do that without insects eating all that, all those strawberries is to use pesticides. And then those pesticides go into people and they create all sorts of problems. And we're recognizing that there's a problem in that food production mechanism, but it's scary from a government perspective to change that <laughs> because now you may not be producing enough food. So I think a way you can remix this profitably, the evolution of food production looks more decentralized. So you can have a farm that has maybe 60 varieties of fru fruits and vegetables that are grown. And then you basically, as the company, you, you can create a, you can create a, a, a package. So you provide the, le the lending arm. So you screen the people who want to become farmers and then you give them the package. Here's the playbook. Here's the plot of land that we're going to give you. Like we're going to loan you this money, but then you have a coach that we coach you through the farming process. We fund you, we, we provide all the workers who do the manual work because those are all the truck drivers who just millions of them just lost their jobs. So we retrain them to be farmers. They're outside, they're working, they're probably living a more healthy lifestyle. And then those, the, the output of that 
is it's going to be involve more, it's going to be more costly to have people do physical work, but then you could have distribution be more efficient where you just have the trucks, our trucks just show up every day. We collect it and then we route it directly to people's homes. So you can go like mm. decentralized farm production with an assisted arm on coaching and make it really, really easy for people to start farms, get all the seeds in the mail, put it in the, it's got videos, YouTubes. It's like, it's like self-service instruction for decentralized farming combined with the pipeline of workers, combined with the distribution of the local delivery. I think that, I think that business needs to be built maybe one day, but that's one that, um, I think is important. That, that should I think be. it has legs. You know, a lot of people are going to more physical, outdoor, nature type of work, more primal work. You know, we've gotten kind of soft <laughs> behind our computers over the years. So people are trying to go back to things a lot more harder, right? I think the pearly one is like, I hate having to book an appointment. I think if you did stats on the amount of appointments that were canceled last minute, dentists would probably be number one. Because I think that is the one where people are like, book it so far in advance. And they just really don't want to, it's not that they don't want their teeth clean or they don't want to, they just can't be bothered. It is such a low priority that having someone come to your house to do it easily, efficiently, I think is, I think, <laughs> I think that would work yeah. to be quite honest. It can be I'm done. also very lazy. Like I don't like to do, and I don't like to do a lot of household chores, nor do I, you know, I'm not the person that's in the yard taking care of my lot either. So I think maybe I'm not the best use case or the best <laughs> target. I'm the best target market for that, but I'm not sure what North Americans, especially Americans, how they feel about that as well. But definitely, you know, disrupting the, the, the dental organization, especially when most of it is covered by many policies, insurance policies. Yeah. Moving on, you know, you're big on this podcast. We talked about getting more of the meeting of the minds, right? It may be conflicting or contradicting views and really sitting down and having a roundtable conversation so that the audience can take in both sides and really get a, a better landscape. And I think what's happened, what I've seen happen over the last 20 years, and maybe even before that, I just never know this, is the media is very biased, right? Like you're not going to probably turn on CNN and see, you know, one dead Palestinian on the news today. That's just not, I could be wrong. Like you just, they only provide the narrative that fits them. We saw during the pandemic, especially in the US, that, you know, CNN had the death counts of the COVID people dying from COVID, which is, you know, they had a, a ticker that was counting, but Fox did not have that, right? So you're seeing that media is very biased. What type of media are you hoping either this medium, I know biology talks kind of like about a, a gray, I think a gray cloud or, you know, a new type of media where it's not so much Republican, Democrat, it's just a contribution or a collection of similar minded or thinking people. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts about on the media today? Now that we see like Joe Rogan's bringing in more viewers and more listeners than some of the more mainstream adopted uh, media channels. I think you're right. I think that the old style of information dissemination and narration, which is the two purposes of media, is changing because primarily the number of eyes, and we'll, we'll call them eyes, but effectively they're cameras, is increasing by a billion times. So if something happened, right? Like, oh my God, this building's on fire or this, this, whatever news is happening, the reporter drives down and they have their camera and they're giving you the, the lens as to what's happening. The biggest driver of change here is that now everybody has that lens. And so mm -hmm. wh why do you now need to go to a reporter? Well, it's still nice to hear sort of a professional describe the scenario, whether it's in Iran, Iraq, Israel, palace, uh, whatever, you know, COVID, whatever the thing is, somebody's put some thought into it. And so the pipeline of information is not, is not the most valuable thing that the media companies offer. Now it's narration. And so the result of that is that it creates this bias where you, you simply can't describe things as they are because that's available, right? Like, well, we can see what's happening. <laughs> now you have to create a story. And the story is what sells. That's what keeps people coming back to the media organizations. And the more you create an exciting story, that may not be truthful, but the more exciting your story is, and the more gripping it is, maybe there's drama, like the other team is doing some evil stuff, these evil Democrats, these evil Republicans, the more I'm going to tune into that, m me being just the audience. So I think that that works until it doesn't. 
it works until people are tired of that story because they say, well, I'm no longer interested in something that's spun. I actually just value the truth and I value to hear a more straightforward perspective. The challenge for media organizations will be, will they sacrifice their short-term revenue for long-term yeah. stability? And, and you can start to see new media organizations pop up on X or Twitter, on other places like the Daily Wire is one, Mike Solana is starting one at Pirate Wires. There's one, what's the guy, Ezra Klein has one on the left side. So there's, there's like this reemergence of narration given the new input of information. That's my perspective on it. I think the advertising dollars that you'll see like a lot of hate, this is a, a good like poignant right. point because you'll see so much hatred of Twitter on mainstream news that's typically not backed by anything factual. You know, Twitter is crashing, yeah. it's done. One year after Twitter, it's, you know, ba who, no one uses yeah. it anymore. Yet, it lost meanwhile, $30 billion, right. <laughs> Elon. Yeah, yeah. All, all this stuff. And if you look at Twitter, it's like, well, it seems to be getting better. The product is better. They've launched a ton of new features. Like by every measure of account, it's better because the mainstream media is losing to Twitter. Twitter is going to take their advertising dollars. So there's a war between the, the outcome of these companies. And I think a lot of what's interesting is a lot of these traditional media are leveraging like influential people as part of their sources, right? They're not getting the news any, you know, it used to be, it felt like they were getting, you know, exclusive news. They had exclusive sources, but they're using a lot of these influencers because they need the eyeballs to their media station. And a lot of these influencers are not coming prepared. They don't have the you know particular background or knowledge. So it's like they're using this information that might not be properly vetted in order to get the eyeballs. But we can see like the distractions it's causing. And that's leading into my second question is like the amount of distractions, especially Americans are seeing day in, day out. What are your thoughts about that? Are we getting too distracted? Are we focusing too much about what's going on around us and not focusing enough on personal development? Or do you think there's a balance? And I can't remember if it was Denzel Washington that said, you know, if you're watching the news, you're misinformed. If you don't watch the news, you're uninformed. <laughs> and I think that was such a, you know, a true statement. I've tried to limit the amount of news, but then that also means I'm limiting the amount of, limiting the amount of sources. So who knows if I'm limiting the amount of sources and that information is biased, it's going to be really biased because I'm receiving such a small sample size. What are your thoughts on, you know, people being distracted now? And it's like, not even like, oh, I'm just distracted. It's, you know, building up of hate and, you know, it's race, it's gender. It's, it, there's so much hate going on because of these distractions. What are your thoughts about that? I think the, the tendency is to look at it on an individual perspective and that say, well, I'm distracted or this is my personal experience and less looking at it from the collective perspective and saying, what's happening to human consciousness? Like their human consciousness is effectively routing information together between minds insanely fast compared to what it used to be. Like information transfer from one, one mind to another it used to be like, I, I typewriter it up, I put it on printer, I send it out, people get it the next day. They don't really respond. Maybe they'll get together in a coffee shop and they'll talk about it. Now it's like, it's like this hyper networked information transfer and, you know, Neuralink would be insane, right? Imagine just plugging something into your head, <laughs> thinking something, and it just happens. You don't even have to type it. You don't even have to read it. Just that would be next level. And I think that next level perspective shows you where we are, which is in this, in this like middle range of stuff's coming at you as fast as you want it to come at you. You know, you used to get one newspaper a day. Now you can read the news all day and you can read it the second it mm -hmm. happens. So it's up to the individual to modulate that. But I do think from a collective level, it accelerates psychological, pu it pushes us forwards in like psychological development. If there was an insecurity that you have in your life, well, you're probably going to find that trigger on the internet somewhere and you're going to feel sad or envious or jealous or hatred, whatever it is. I think the answer is not to shun that. This is probably a contrarian take, but most people would say like anything that's hateful should be banned. We should censor it. We should get rid of it. Hmm. And I tend to think that it's better to put it out there in the light and then show how idiotic it is and let it just dissolve its power. Because I, I view hatred grows in the shadows. 
If you ban it, mm-hmm. people will get together. They'll feel like, well, there's got to be some truth there. The book that gets banned yeah. is the one that everyone wants to read. It could be full of garbage. But if you ban it, everyone's going to be like, well, there's some secret truth that they don't want you to read about. As I say, it feels like, yeah, that's kind of how we think. So I, the tendency is to like surface that discomfort and, and confront it and ask the hard questions and be truthful and speak the truth, even if there's a consequence for it, it'll be better in the long run for you and everyone else. You know, and it's funny that you mentioned that 15 years from the Bitcoin white paper, you've been doing this show for 10 years. I remember listening with, you know, to this podcast when Bitcoin was at $700. And I remember, and I always repeat this. I remember when Brian Romley said, you know, I envision a $10,000 Bitcoin. And I remember people were going off in the comments. People were going off on Twitter. Like, what is this guy? He's insane. There would never be a 10,000 Twitter. And then like it hit 60,000. We're like, oh, you know, laser eyes, a hundred thousand. We need a hundred thousand or a million dollar Bitcoin. Tell me, take us through that process of, you know, covering and talking to people that were in the Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency industry then. And when that first hype cycle hit in 2017, what it felt like to be a part of the community, what's changed and how are things changing, right? Like NFTs come, NFTs go. Metaverse comes, Metaverse goes. Whereas I think before it felt like a slow growth for Bitcoin and the community, where it's now it's like people jumping on and off like it's a train. Can you, can you walk us through the last 10 years for you yeah. in cryptocurrency and Bitcoin? Oh man, it's a good question. I think that people probably, like what, what actually happens? Why do these, th- really the question is why do they go? You know, they come because there's something, there's some novel technology, but why are they not useful? That just may be how human beings, it's almost like picture like a, like a tendril. Like, you know, if you don't know what's out there in the world, you're just going to feel and feel and feel with your blinders on until you bump into something and then you're going to turn and go somewhere else. And I kind of feel that's what humans do with technology is we like build and build and build until we hit something that's interesting. And then we like move around that. And NFTs, Metaverse, VR, AI, all this stuff is kind of like, we're like figuring it out as it's emerging. You know, no one is inventing AI. We're kind of like discovering it. Same with crypto. It's like, well, we're discovering the mathematical truths of cryptography that make this possible. And so I think there's probably like a a mispricing, like a natural innate tendency to overprice the value of technology in the early days because we want to live a better life. We want things to be better than they are today. And so the promise of that is so compelling that we'll we'll misprice it and think, well, this is going to be, NFTs are going to like, they're going to, basically they're going to improve my life so much that I'm willing to misprice it. Misprice meaning I'll buy Bitcoin at $60,000 and think it's going to go to a hundred and so I, I think that's, that plays the role. Like I think psychology is dramatically under incorporated into the mental model of the technology adoption. The question, why do things drop? Why, why are NFTs, why did those really not stick with society? Maybe it's a matter of just timing. Like we have to circle back to them to find real practical use cases. Yeah. The types of people who got in there, maybe there's 5% of people who are actually really passionate about building and the rest just want to make money. That would be my assumption. And the rest, that, are, they're already in the AI. They, 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 they've gone long yeah. past. They went from, you yeah. know, They've already changed their LinkedIn profile to AI and chat GPT expert. Mm -hmm. And they were real estate experts just before, and social media experts just before crypto came out, right? Or before NFTs got hot. Now, you've interviewed hundreds of founders. You've seen a lot of business cases behind the scenes over the last 10 years. Was there anything you're like, oh man, including Bitcoin itself. Was there anything that you're like, I knew this was a good product or a service. I knew this was an amazing protocol. It piqued my interest. I stayed up late researching about it, not just for the guests, but because I just fell down the rabbit hole. I really wish I went all in on this because I I just, I knew it. Even myself listening to your episode back in 2015, it's like, I knew it. I wanted to get involved. There was opportunities maybe to invest more, do more at the time. Did you have any of those, you know, those, I could have invested in Facebook before it went public kind type, type moments for you? Hindsight 2020, of course, but I think a, a good mentality is to not be greedy because when everyone is greedy, that's when you get washed out in the tides and you could be right directionally, but wrong 
because everyone else is there. Like I remember we would have conversations with our investors and they'd say, I love this team. I love this product. I love this market. This is an awesome company, but they're just priced too high. And they're priced too high because mm. everyone else is willing to buy too high. So what do you do mm. in that situation? You know, say, don't look at it from an individual perspective. Say you're managing a fund with $100 million. Do you have the discipline to go three or four years without making any investments because you're, you're convinced that everything is too high? Like peer pressure pushes people to join the masses. And it's, it's I don't even want to say it's hard. It's like, it's borderline not tenable to go against the grain if you have people who are pushing you to do so. Uh, you know, there's like the Nassim Tlaib investment philosophy, which is you bet against the market every day for 10 years. And then the one day the black sheep event happens and you make all your money. There's something to be said for that investment style, but I think a better way for most people, myself included, is just diversify. Just say, okay, I believe in this technology. I'll, I'll put a healthy amount into it. But if it drops for the next 10 years and it doesn't actually, maybe I'm 10 years wrong in the, on the timeline, then that's okay too. I think what kills people is when they go so, they believe in something like Bitcoin, which makes sense on so many levels. Yeah. But then you might just be wrong on timing. Like the government killed psychedelic medicine in the 70s for 50 years. And now we're starting to see the emergence of the studies that show psilocybin and MDMA have these medicinal properties that can effectively cure PTSD for veterans and help people with mental issues that are like, it's like a 80%, 90% drop in PTSD for five years. Like, like the numbers are unbelievably good. But there's, you, were, you, could be, you could make a bet in that field 50 years ago and be right, but be wrong by 50 years. And so who's to say that Senator Elizabeth Warren won't effectively kill crypto <laughs> in, the, in the Western world? Like it's a battle happening now for timing. I mean, I, I think it's clear, like it's, it's, the, it's the next level of technology, but it's a, it's a battle for timing. So and timing matters on pricing. And investing. Tell me your thoughts when it comes. You just mentioned, you know, the regulatory landscape in the U.S. is very vague compared to other jurisdictions. I was just in Dubai. There seems like it has a pretty good handle on virtual assets as well as some other free zones there. Did the IFC also? When you're looking across the EU, Mika or Mika, however you want to pronounce it, they seem like they've created comprehensive regulations around cryptocurrency, the travel rule, etc., with digital assets. Why is the U.S. struggling so much? Like even Canada, I yeah. feel here, we figured it out pretty quickly. Why is the U.S. struggling? Is there so much money on either side that nobody wants to kind of back down and compromise when it comes to regulations because they have other vested interests when it comes to cryptocurrency? Or is it just one of those things where the U.S. is being a, a little bit too conservative? Well, who's struggling? Who, who's losing? Well, I'd say, the, I'd say the entire United States when it comes to it, we see a lot of the Biggest crypto companies are leaving the U.S. and going to other jurisdictions. Yeah. So I think the country itself is really losing. Innovation is losing, especially when the executive order talks about Biden wanting the U.S. to be, you know, the leader of innovation. That's kind of laughable when it, you look at how hard it is to decide whether cryptocurrency is a security or commodity or, or anything mm -hmm. else. I think, I think you're right that crypto companies are losing in the U.S. I think you're right that U.S. citizens largely are losing. I think... You can't just say the United States because there's so many different incentives of groups. I think the incumbent traditional banking infrastructure is not losing because of crypto. The <laughs> political apparatus in DC is not losing because of crypto banning. In fact, they're probably further cementing their power. One of the largest leverage points that the United States has internationally is sanctions. So if the government in the United States can sanction a country and offer real soft power destruction, then that's a, that's a weapon they really don't want to lose. And crypto is a direct threat to that weapon. If Bitcoin and, and crypto are widely adopted and the, the power dynamic is, is drained out of Washington, D.C. for the control of, of the global monetary supply, then they lose that leverage. So I think that's where they're coming from. And there's enough money in the traditional banking infrastructure that can donate to lobbyists that fund people like Elizabeth Warren, that there's a game theory dynamic that says, well, they're going to 
they have all this money that these company, these traditional banking infrastructure layers have, they're going to give it to some senator. So some senator is going to take the bait and sell their soul. And that's Elizabeth Warren. I don't think she believes any of this shit she says, but there is political incentive to fight for the incumbent businesses that are out, the incumbent industries. And, you know, the United States isn't going to benefit from losing the global reserve currency. Now, there may be a spin on this. There may be like, you could also look at it as like the global reserve currency is like a resource curse. You know, countries that have the greatest resources sometimes disproportionately so have bad corruption and economic output, political instability and so forth. You could certainly make an argument that the global reserve currency for the USD is a resource curse for the economy and the and society. I, I I probably buy that. I think especially so we've been we've been owning it so long that we kind of get <laughs> lazy and lose the edge. You know, like we basically run Wall Street runs, you know, most of the world's banking system. So so I, I think it's like a it's a predictable confrontation between old school, new school. But I just think it's it's up to people like you and me to call attention to that, for people to recognize that they want a better life. And so we have to be comfortable letting old things transition out and welcoming in the next world, even if we don't know how it's going to go. Like, we got to jump on board. Yeah. You got to jump on board. What's well, interesting, I feel like, you know, some of the U.S. companies or the U.S. institutions, they're investing in the background, BlackRock, Fidelity. They're making heavy bets on cryptocurrency or at least digital assets you know, real world asset tokenization, they're making heavy bets there. So I think, you know, they're almost front running the regulations, right? Let's get our, let's get our chips in first. Mm -hmm. And then when it does become legalized or when the regulations do unfold, we're in the best position to profit from that. Yeah. We saw that a lot in Canada with the legalization of cannabis, you know, for years, if you, if you had a, a, a dime bag of weed, you know, you would get arrested, you get put in jail. It'd be this huge thing. Now people are, you know, selling it. So much so that it was an essential service in Canada during COVID. The government that wouldn't keep gyms open actually kept a lot of the you know, government-run cannabis shops open because they said it was essential for people's mental health or medical health. So that's so interesting how the script has flipped. But there's companies there that profited it from that greatly, whereas like you know a low-level you know marijuana dealer that may have a couple of baggies. They're the ones that got persecuted for years. So it's very interesting to see how some of these cases, especially, you know, with the Silk Road owner, I'll keep on forgetting his name, but, but like, he's like, it seems like paying for everything that is going to be happening with crypto now. Russ Albright, obviously there's a lot of concern about what was said and what was done at the time, but yeah, very interesting. We've been talking for a great amount of time. I could talk to you all day, but while we wrap up in the next five minutes and just kind of like, where do you see the show going? Where do you see, you know, the payments? Like, you know, open banking is one thing I did want to talk to you about because in Canada, that's a big deal. We have like five major banks here that can completely control the way banking is done in Canada. And many open banking, whether it's apps or fintechs that come in here and just completely get obliterated, probably with what you saw with, you know, Stripe and Square, what they've done to small markets. Either they buy you up or they completely shut you off. What are your thoughts about open banking here in, in North America? Well, let me answer kind of the first thing you asked, because I view that as a really important question. Like, what's our purpose here? What's our mission? Mm. And I view it as, as the digital town square and what was originally Twitter came about, there was the early adopters and people who wanted to push society forward. The progressives, the, the liberals jumped on there because it's a tool to communicate. And that eventually became consensus where this is where the conversation was happening. And then everything else was downstream of that. So if a politician wanted to confirm their you know, views on abortion, like they tweet it out. That's how they let the world know. And I view, you can start to, you can see it absolutely now where politicians of both sides are on Twitter or X. And I view long form podcasting is still an emerging, but very important communication layer where you see a deeper perspective into somebody that you that allows you to assess their understanding their knowledge everything about them that you just can't do from a tweet and so we yeah. now have a disproportionate in the same way the early people on twitter were going to be of a certain progressive style they're pushing society forward and then the conservatives jump on and then they discuss the same thing on podcasting <laughs> you have the people who are really 
tech forward and push the world forward, progressive, they're on podcasting. And so I think the next important phase of this is you have to get people of the, of the conservative mindset to come on and engage with people who are on the progressive mindset so we don't spiral in one direction. And that, 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 that engagement of minds in a live verbal conversation allows people to, to, to get deeper into truth of what different people have to offer much quicker and in a different kind of way than Twitter. Because listening to a two-hour conversation between two people who disagree is going to surface more insight than a Twitter thread back and forth. And so I think building a friendly atmosphere where we, people know that they can come here and we're, we're trying to get at the truth and trying to get at the truth in a respectful way, but in a challenging way is, is really also really interesting. Like people lo- really crave yeah. that. Yeah. Like I have a big criticism of Pierce Morgan, who, who often brings people on his podcast. We'll call it a podcast. He does it in a fancy studio, but it's the same thing. And he disagrees with many people he brings on and he brings on people who disagree, but he does it. My criticism of him is he's very confrontational. He doesn't allow people to speak their, their full piece. He'll cut them off. He'll make them look a certain way. And I think that's a different generation or a different attitude than, than I think, than I think what is what people crave. So he's, he's more focused on proving them wrong than, you know, allowing, exploring opportunity for healthy discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I like watching him too, because when I did, which is exactly what I think some people like, right? When he's disagreeing with somebody and you are in agreement with him, can't wait for him to get that person on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, see, that's why we disagree with you. And see, look, you couldn't even respond to him. And, you know, that's why we're right and you're wrong. But I think what you're saying is so true. I think right now we realize there's, you know, there's, I think we're far away from what's right and wrong versus, you know, let's explore what the, possibilities of the truth could be yeah everyone's so worried about being right or wrong nobody's like hey well what's true here what can we agree on what are some things that we can agree on because even when someone's right or wrong there's a median in between that we can agree on certain facts just like when we go to court there's they always say to the both sides let's what what facts do we agree upon and then we will focus on what we disagree upon i think that's what we need to get to we're so focused on the disagreement i feel in society we forgot to leave at least and say hey, what do I agree with this person on? Uh, and it's hard. Yeah, yeah. I think the way the media is today, it's like everyone needs to take a side in order to get noticed. Even on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok, it's like I have to be pro-Palestinian or I have to be for Israel. There's no in-between. There's no one to say, hey, you know, I don't like what they did here, but I disagree with they did. No, it's like either you're with us or you're against us. That's it. And I think that puts people in really awkward situations because they don't even have enough education to choose sides. So they just choose the easier option. They just choose what they feel others would choose in their situation. And I think that's really, really, really hurt society. I think, I think we stopped talking. We stopped debating. We stopped discussing. We just like, Hey, I'm going to post about this pro Palestine tomorrow. Yeah. I'm going to be pro Ukraine. The next day I'm going to be against, against opioids or for, you know, you know, a pro pro choice or pro life. It's so interesting how the mainstream media has kind of almost put us in just two buckets. Yeah. And if you agree with it, you can't even talk to the other bucket. And if you talk to the other bucket or explore the truth of the other bucket, you're then labeled as something else, right? A racist, a sexist, homophobic, transphobic. It's so interesting what, what we've kind of, we've kind of pigeonholed ourselves away from healthy discussions now. And I, I'm hoping that this podcast will open up some of those discussions, at least on the tech payment side and the media side. Yeah, yeah. And then we, we could even expand out from there. One of my favorite quotes is, you can't hate anybody you understand. I, I love that because it doesn't emphasize agreeing. It's, it, I think disagreement is good. It, it, we, we, if we all agreed, then that would mean we're probably missing something. <laughs> so you can have different <laughs> preferences. Like I can prefer, to, you know, different people have different preferences, which result in different perspectives and disagreements. But to not understand the other side means you're cognitively like completely in a different realm. And that's where you can just say, well, we have to kill them because they're not, they're not, we're not connected yeah. on any level. And I view Israel Palestine as worst case scenario because the lack of understanding for so long has led 
each side to say, well, we have to exterminate the other side, you know, and, and they're, and that, that becomes the mission. And, and as that's like, that's like conversa lack of conversation, the results of sustained lack of conversation and understanding. Exactly. I think you've put it perfectly. And I think that's a great way. And I'm sure we're going to have much more podcasts mm -hmm. where we can go deeper and diver uh, deeper into some of these situations. And it'll be fun to have you kind of come on once in a while and maybe give me a report card on yeah. how you think I'm doing, interviewing some of the guests who we're bringing on. But I'm extremely excited. Uh, it's been a dream to be even a listener of the podcast, now to be a host, and even just to work with you and Faisal to the most part is really exciting. Because uh, I've learned so much from you from far away. So uh, just seeing your process. And I think anyone else that has a podcast out there doesn't really see the behind the scenes that you've put in to making this an essential weekly podcast for so many listeners around the world. Over a million downloads is not a number that you can scoff at. And being 10 years relevant in a, an industry that's changing every week, it seems. I think that's something to be very, very proud of, of what you've created here. And I hope to not only continue it, but to maybe bring in different perspectives and really heighten the level of this podcast and contribute to it. Hell yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> that sounds awesome. All right, right. <laughs> sounds good, Mike. Until next time, we'll talk soon. All right, Stephen.